I've had the opportunity, as I as was mentioned, I grew up in a, in a on the end of a dusty road in southwest Kansas on a row crop farm, and my worldview at that point in time was about uh, the size of the county. I graduated with 36 people in my high school, and I've had an opportunity to do a few things along the way that has has changed a lot of what I thought was was uh, was you know the way that the world worked, I guess, and so. Um, over the last year, I've really had an opportunity to spend time working at the opposite end of the food chain where you guys spend your day-to-day -day activities. And, and for me, that has been one of the most enlightening things to, to, uh, to experience. There are folks making decisions today that will ultimately impact how things are done on your operations. And I think you know that. I think you get that, that reality. Um, but it's, it's something that's happening at an increasing pace. So let me uh, let me try to do a few things. I know uh, you got a lot of good stuff coming up here, and we want to get get on to uh, to the things that uh, that you guys have put in place. But if I could provide just a couple of things around perspective. Number one, I want to talk a little bit about this food security piece and kind of get a global perspective and maybe tie it back to beef. Uh, as an organization and as a company, Elanco, very clearly we have a very very clear focus around those 7,000 plus employees around the world. You ask them every day, what is it that you're that you're driving towards? What, why are we here? Uh, very consistently, you'll hear this, this message play back. Our, our, our purpose, our mission around feeding the world is one that resonates very well. So we'll talk a little bit about that. I also want to provide just a little bit of context in terms of some of my reflections over the last year being involved with the food chain side of this thing. What's happening today? Who's making decisions around the food chain uh, in, within these food chain, chain companies? And what are some of the things that are in And um, third thing is how do we... How do we go from here? What do we what do we do to address some of the things that we can address relative to that? So this is in a nutshell, and you, you've, you've seen a lot of this, but this is how it's how it's framed up. Uh, there's not a lot of argument. Maybe you've argued one way or the other around the numbers, but if you look at the macro signals around what it is that we're trying to do, we have an increasing population, an increasing affluence of population that's going to result in a dramatic increase in demand for the product that we produce, 60% increase in demand for protein as we go forward. If you look at that on a beef basis, 43% increase in demand for beef over that time period. And so we see the factors that are at play there. From, from a local standpoint, the impacts that that, that that has, globalization, volatility, right? One year prices are high, well next year prices are low. We're seeing much more of that volatility occurring because the macro signals are saying there's a big demand out there and there's a lot of factors at play in terms of how we how we meet that demand. So that's the piece. One of the things that people talk about is this population increase, but the most significant impact really of this is going to happen in the next 10 years or so, and that's going to be the movement into the middle class of 3 billion people around the world. Three billion people moving into the middle class shifts what they eat for dinner, for lunch, for breakfast. It shifts the demand for protein significantly. They move from a vegetation-based diet to a plant, uh, from a plant-based diet to an animal protein-based diet. And we're seeing that right now as you look in places like Asia, as you look in places like Africa. And the, the numbers of population of people that are making that shift has a dramatic impact on us in, in the way that we do business. The third piece we talked about, we heard, we heard sustainability mentioned, right? Sometimes that gets kind of thrown into a negative connotation. The reality is, I said and having conversations with some this morning, they're not making more rangeland, are they? They're taking it away. We're not making more farmland. We're not going to solve this by chopping down more rainforests in Brazil. So the reality is that we have to continue to face this challenge around increasing global production and productivity and demand while we do that in a way that minimizes or even freezes our impact in terms of environmental sustainability, environmental footprint. We talk about uh, the, the uh, World Wildlife Fund is a group that we've worked with as well. We've been good partners that understand the role that technology plays in productivity and agriculture. Uh, seem to be balanced in that approach uh, from our standpoint. They talk about Earth Overshoot Day, the day in the year at which we have consumed 100% of the natural resources that we produce on an annual basis globally. I don't know how they figure that out. There's smarter people than me working on that. But in 2007, that day was in October. 2015, that day is in August, right? So the consumption of our resources continues to increase, and that's a trend as we think about stewards of agriculture and producers of food and protein that, that we have to address. So that's the three global kind of realities as you think about food security around the world. One thing that I would point you to is the uh, recently released 2015 GAP report. Uh, Global Harvest Initiative is an organization that 
we're involved with and support. Every year they put out what they call a gap report. It's a, it's a look at the global, uh, what they call total factor of productivity around the world. And this includes crops and meats and everything else. And, and what we have seen consistently since the mid 2000s and we started to put this thing together is that the projection of where we're going in terms of demand and the projection of where we are relative to our productivity is creating a gap. And that gap is continuing. While we're, we're making strides in places like the U.S., North America, in terms of productivity, you look at developing countries, that's flattening out and declining. So the, the dramatic increase that we need to, uh, to address also has to, has to rely on the shoulders of, of those of us that, that, that understand how to make, make productivity a reality. We talk about bridge proteins. As we move this middle class, this three billion people from the middle class from vegetation-based diets to protein-based diets, the bridge proteins are the first ones that we start to see. Eggs, meat, or eggs and milk and, and chicken, poultry. Because of lower cost, more availability, those are the bridge proteins. Even, even from that, we see a significant gap. 7% is projected to be the gap of what is, what is demanded versus what we're able to produce. We've got outbreaks of disease around every, nearly every continent, avian bird flu. If you look at the productivity of egg production over the last five to seven years globally, we're losing productivity. We're losing the number of eggs per hen per year. So those are the factors that we have to continue to kind of put into the forefront as we talk about this conversation of why is it that we do what we do. This is one of the one of the pieces where we've uh, we've been really trying to work with uh, with policymakers to help understand if we could just move the average, if we could take the best in class in terms of where we produce most productively where we produce most efficiently and begin to move that average forward, we could have a dramatic impact. And you can see examples across that. I can't see it as well from here. But if you look at on the beef side, right, the best in class production of beef, beef over a two-year time period versus a five-year time period if you look globally, right? If you look at, egg, if you look at dairy production, the production from, from two gallons, global average, to eight gallons in terms of productivity. So the impacts can be, can be huge. And so as we think about what it is that we do, why we do it, the reasons that we're in this business, ultimately, that's one of the things that I think is very, very critical for all of us to, to come to grips with and make it very personal. Talk a little about the beef story. This is some research that we, we did uh, recently looking at uh, each, each species, each protein, if you will, what does that gap look like as we go forward? 2050 is kind of a number that's thrown out there in terms of a milestone or a mile marker. What's this gap look like in 2050? If, regardless of the species, there's two different paths that we can typically go down. We can go down a path where we continue or grow our innovation and productivity, or where we freeze that to where we're at today. And so we try to bring those, those two examples in contrast. When you look at it on the beef side, we've got uh, 1.6 billion beef producing animals. Now that seems like a lot. When you get into parts of Asia, India, and so forth, a lot of those are not cows, but they're water buffalo, right? So we look at a global number that includes that. But if you look at what we need as we go forward, the, the demand for beef, just like the demand for other proteins, continues to grow. We're going to have to increase that productivity uh, by, uh, by 43%. And so if you do that based on kind of our current projections around innovation, where we're at uh, in terms of productivity, the utilization of technology, in order to meet that demand, we're going to have to find a place for 710 million more beef producing animals globally. So where are they going to go? What are we going to feed them? What are we going to water them with? Right? So those are some of the those are some of the macro level challenges that I think that we continue to put in front of policymakers as we engage around shaping the environment in which we're working. These are real these are real issues that we have to we have to bring to the forefront. The two options that we have, add 710 million beef producing animals or we know by moving that average towards the top tier of productivity, we can get there producing 43% more as we, uh, as we demonstrate that we need, freezing the footprint of, of, of beef production globally, reducing 682 million animals that would be required versus the previous example that I showed you, reducing total forage utilization, total water utilization. So this is why we engage, and I'm, I'm very excited to, to hear that you guys are, are engaging as well with some of these groups their lens of the world is the environmental side, right? Our lens of the world includes that, but it's around this protein production and productivity piece. And that makes for some strong partnerships, or can make for some strong partnerships as we continue to, to drive.
drive, drive forward around that. So, every day when you get up, what's driving, what's driving your decisions? What's driving your business? You know, one of the things that I think has really become clear to us is as we're, as we're trying to, to get into the conversation, as we're trying to push forward around some of these, these areas of opening market access and ensuring that technology is part of the conversation and that we're not losing more technology than we're gaining on a daily basis, it gets tough. It gets hard. I woke up this morning. I had a little tweet on my, uh, on my, uh, whatever you call it, Ryan, the, the, my timeline on my Twitter account, right? Something that I posted about uh, some good work that folks were doing to try to get some toys for tots uh, with agricultural toys into the, the toys for tots program. Apparently, that offended some vegan out there and said that I was, uh, you know, propagating lies and and and, and pushing a lot of things. Uh, so, so you see that coming at you all the time, right? When you, when you step into this and you begin to engage, you see that coming at you. And so grounding back to what is this vision that we're, we're really driving towards? What is the impact of a food secure world in terms of quality of life, in terms of nutrition, in terms of communities and families? It was mentioned that I did have the opportunity, I've had, I've had the opportunity to travel into some of these developing areas. When I was in Buenos Aires, I remember one time we were sitting on the sidewalk having pizza out there in the, in the middle of the city, 12 million. I, Blows my mind to even think about that many people in one spot. And we're sitting there having having a pizza. A little girl walks up after we were finished up, and she she picked the, the scraps of pizza up off of our table, the crust, the pieces we didn't eat. She went around the corner. So we got up as we left. We went around the corner. There was a mom right there, nursing her little brother, presumably, and they were sitting around those scraps of pizza. So that's that's food insecurity, right? I can tell you as well, I live, in, live near Indianapolis, our, our global headquarters uh, for Eli Lilly, the company that I, that Elanka was a part of, is, is downtown Indianapolis, right? So you got 12 floors of corporate structure, you got all this stuff that's there. Less than 10 minutes from that corporate headquarters, you've got moms and families that are on um, school-supported uh, lunch programs. If their idea of protein is what they can get at the convenience store, Right, backpack dependent. So you don't have to go across the world. And I guarantee you, you can find it even in, in rural communities in Montana, where the food security piece is, is significant. And so that's what's driving us. That's what we're trying to do. We know that there's a lot of a lot of forces out there that are against us, but but keeping that vision very very clear. So we talk about three things that helps us to do that. Innovation addresses this protein gap that we talked about. Choice. We know that not all consumers are the same. We know that some consumers want something prepared and done in a certain way, and others, they just want some food. They want it cheap, and they want it safe, all right? So we, we, we talk about choice. We talk about how do we not eliminate choices and options from the marketplace. Uh, and we talk about trade. As we go forward, we're gonna see more and more impact, and we're, we're already seeing this, but food needs to be produced in places where it can be produced sustainably from an environmental standpoint, efficiently from a cost standpoint, and safely. And it needs to be sent to places where the demand is the greatest. And trade is a big part of that. And, and trade will become increasingly important for our industry as, as it already has. You look at the ownership of, 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 of production.